So I'm willing to bet that you probably only use one, maybe two passwords, none of which are probably all that safe since you want to be able to remember them. Well, I'm going to politely ask that you stop the madness right now with the help of today's sponsor, NordPass. Brought to you by the cybersecurity experts over at NordVPN, NordPass both generates and remembers your complex passwords for you so you don't have to. Just click to autofill and you're all set. Aside from signing in to various social media accounts, this is obviously ideal for online shopping, and to top this all off, NordPass even offers secure password sharing, which is my go-to when I need to give an editor access to a stock footage site or any other account. No sending passwords over email or sketchy messenger apps. Download NordPass for free today at nordpass.com. Again, that's nordpass.com or click the link down below. And with that said, let's begin. Welcome to episode 5 of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we take a look at five real-life tales dealing in everything from a Twitter loophole that allows for child exploitation, all the way to an attempted murder gone viral for all the wrong reasons. As the title suggests, the content of this video is disturbing. Your discretion is advised. At the start of this year, a new but disturbingly familiar issue came to light amongst Twitter users in the form of hashtag megalinks. On the surface, this hashtag probably sounds a bit esoteric. You hear it, but aren't sure exactly what it's about. Regardless, it sounds like it's harmless, something that you might not think twice about. If back then, however, you decided to explore it, you may have just ended up traumatized. What you would find is a lot of not safe for work content being networked via the hashtag, and in and of itself, this doesn't seem all that bad until you take a closer look. You'll start to see other tags like teens, jailbait, young boys slash girls, and even just straight up requests for child pornography. While the hashtag currently seems to have mostly cleared up due to mass reporting and heightened awareness of the issue, every so often you'll still see someone there who claims to be either selling or on the market for child porn. This is obviously a lot to unpack, so let's start at the beginning. What exactly is hashtag megalinks? While the links part is self-explanatory, Mega actually refers to a file sharing site called Mega.nz. Now, in case that sounds familiar, you might have heard of its predecessor, Mega Upload, a site that in 2013 was actually seized by the US Department of Justice and ultimately shut down for piracy. By 2014, Mega had taken its place, and what makes Mega stand out as far as cloud storage goes is its encryption. Alice and Bob are lawyers and need to store and exchange highly confidential documents with their clients. Bob simply uploads them to the cloud storage that he has always used. Unfortunately, they are stored without proper encryption, so Bob and his clients have to rely on the security assurances made by that company. Alice is smart. Alice uses Mega, which encrypts all data before it is sent, with cryptographic keys that only she controls. Nobody else, not even Mega, has access to them. Because all Mega client products are open source and subject to inspection by security researchers, Alice does not have to take Mega's word for the security of her crucial information. Only parties of Alice's choosing receive the keys required to decrypt the files that she shares with them. For the less tech savvy out there, the whole point is that Mega itself does not have access to the files they host, meaning for all intents and purposes, what's stored there is truly private. As the video suggests, this actually does have practical and completely legal applications, especially in the current era. But the problem here is that if, say, a client were to upload illegal content, not even Mega itself could turn it into the authorities since they simply don't have the keys to it. Now, it is important to note that Mega is far from the only site that offers client-side encryption, and beyond that, cloud storage is only one half of the equation. These pedophiles wouldn't have a way to find each other in the first place without some kind of networking tool, in this case, Twitter. 
Without a doubt, Twitter is one of the biggest social media sites out there, so how is this stuff allowed to exist? Twitter has an entire page dedicated to its policies relating to child exploitation, and at first, they all seem good. Twitter has zero tolerance towards any material that features or promotes child sexual exploitation, one of the most serious violations of the Twitter rules. This may include media, text, illustrated, or computer-generated images. Regardless of the intent, viewing, sharing, or linking to child exploitation material contributes to the re-victimization of the depicted children. So below this are actually bullet points that expand on the matter, stating that things like sharing fantasies about minors or expressing a desire to obtain child exploitative material are intolerable offenses. And again, users really began sounding the alarms on this issue at the beginning of this year, and as such have mass-reported pedophile accounts associated with hashtag megalinks. For the most part, this seems to have greatly reduced the problem, but not really. And here's why. Even with the hashtag under fire, pedophiles and child predators are a massive problem for Twitter in general. Now, given all the seemingly great policies I just discussed, how is that still allowed to exist? Well, a March 2019 policy update actually allowed for a massive loophole. I'm sure you've heard of maps or minor attracted persons, which is what a lot of self-admitted pedophiles have chosen to call themselves online and amongst their own community. Note the language there, minor attracted person. Now, let's look a little deeper at Twitter's child exploitation policy. Like I said earlier, it starts off well with stuff about how such material or postings are absolutely not tolerated. But once you get into the what is not in violation of this policy part, you get this. Discussions related to child sexual exploitation as a phenomenon or attraction towards minors are permitted, provided that they don't promote or glorify child exploitation in any way. So this of course begs the question, how exactly does one express attraction to minors without glorifying child exploitation? In the strictest sense, attraction and action aren't technically the same thing, but when we're talking about the nuances of online communities and really the internet in general, this policy really amounts to leaving a door open for predators to get away with normalizing sexual abuse. Even worse, this could also protect predators who are using Twitter to contact minors directly. In theory, a grown adult could tweet a 12-year-old about how, quote, hot they are or something, and that would be perfectly acceptable under Twitter's policy. Hashtag Megalinks isn't the first networking tool to be used by child predators, and unfortunately it isn't and won't be the last. According to an article by Rappler.com from May of 2020, child pornography was once again being marketed and sold on Twitter using a completely different set of hashtags, this time selling for as low as 100 Philippine pesos or roughly 2 US dollars. The piece opens with a disturbing scene tweeted out by a peddler of child porn. A boy stares into the camera. The phone's yellow flash illuminates his face, highlighting features that suggest he is barely in his teens. He is in a dark room, sitting on what looks like a plastic bench. The camera points downward, revealing that the boy is naked from the waist down. At the 20 second mark, a hand moves into frame and starts touching the boy's private parts. The video cuts abruptly. A sneak peek is up. To watch the entire video, according to the tweet, you'd have to pay 300 Philippine pesos or just 6 US dollars. This is obviously just one disturbing example amongst a seemingly never-ending sea of child exploitation material that exists online. The lesson maybe to take away here is that child pornography isn't confined to the deep web like many of us would like to believe. It's not exclusively distributed by clandestine pedophile rings either because it doesn't always need to be. With sites like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Google Drive, Dropbox, etc. I could keep going on, it's easier than ever for pedophiles to have decentralized communities where they pop up and disappear before anyone can even blink. Of course, most people who come across these things online report it and try their best to get the operation shut down, but even then, the efforts seem to be futile. Get an account reported and banned and another will simply spring up in its place. It's hard to say what the best solution here is, but one thing that's for sure is that tech companies really haven't done enough to try to mitigate the issue. The question that many people have now is how much more it'll really take until they finally, finally budge.
If you were paying attention at all in June of this year, then you probably heard about the viral TikTok video where a group of Seattle teenagers find a body in a suitcase, but chances are you actually haven't heard about the subsequent investigation or the arrest that was made in connection to the murders. We'll get to that, but let's start at the very beginning for anyone unaware of the situation. On June 19th, 2020, a young TikTok user and their friends were having a bit of fun using the help of Randonautica, an app that generates a random set of coordinates which users then head to for the sake of exploration. In this particular case, the app sent the teens over to 1150 Alki Avenue Southwest, which happened to be just off the coast. Once there, the group happened upon a black suitcase lying upon a cluster of rocks. Like anyone would, they decided to see if anything was in it. This is what happened next. Guys, we found a, a suitcase at the beach. Gabby, go. I'll hold your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Bro. <laughs> Wait, open it. <laughs> open it. <laughs> it stinks, y'all. <laughs> Oh. Oh. Okay, so she made Okay, so she's calling the police so we can see if it's actually a dead body or it's just food. <laughs> First, we want to be given some breaking news. Seattle police are investigating after several bags filled with human remains were found near the water on Alki Avenue this afternoon. I want to show you a look here at what's happening there. Police say they have they had received a call about a suspicious bag. They found more once arriving on the scene. You can see police out there right now. Harbor Patrol also helping out and the King County Medical Examiner's Office has been called in. For most people, this is where the story ends, their attention quickly shifting towards a then newly emerging wave of clickbait creepy randomnautica content. The actual case, however, quickly faded into obscurity, but this is the rest of the story. Following the discovery of these suitcases, King County Medical Examiners identified the remains as that of 35-year-old Jessica Lewis and 27-year-old Austin Wenner, a couple who had been together for nearly a decade. But how exactly did they end up dismembered and left at sea? Right now, this is still an active case, but local authorities are pretty certain they have their guy. In all, the investigation lasted exactly two months. The bodies of Jessica and Austin, if you recall, were found on June 19th. On August 19th, a warrant was served to search the property of one Michael Lee Dudley, age 62. Now, who exactly is this guy and why are authorities so certain that he's the culprit? WestsideSeattle.com actually obtained a copy of Seattle PD's probable cause report, and the details outlined in it are damning. According to the report, Michael Lee Dudley actually lived with the victims, or rather, they lived with him as tenants. Police were able to obtain the couple's cell phone records, and they indicated that Jessica and Austin's phones stopped transmitting data on June 9th at approximately 7 p.m., 10 whole days before their bodies would eventually be discovered. The report goes on to say that one of the last people contacted by the couple before their phones went out was none other than their landlord. This is already bad enough, but we're only at the tip of the iceberg here. According to witnesses, Dudley didn't get along very well with the couple, and they seemed to frequently clash over instances of unpaid rent and other vague issues, such as Dudley's insistence that the couple would somehow bring crime into his home. Once detectives were able to search the residence, they found everything from bullet holes to blood in the couple's room, dubbed the Blue Room in the report. To make matters even worse, surrounding neighbors were interviewed as well, and according to them, they'd actually called the police on the Dudley residence on the night of June 9th after hearing both gunfire and a young man screaming, Please don't do this, just let me leave. According to records, police did respond to the call, but ultimately left when no one answered the door. 
A female witness later told police that she'd visited the residence later that same evening, and that the so-called blue room contained what she described as a pile of clothes on the floor, of which a, quote, bloody arm was visibly protruding from. Dudley then asked her to leave, claiming that he had to, quote, clean up his mess, and when asked about it later, he told the witness, quote, that his gun had worked and that his didn't. Although Dudley didn't specify who he was, it's quite obvious that he was referring to Austin. Following the search, Dudley was put into custody, where he admitted to police that he and the couple had been staying together during quarantine, and that it was just the three of them. On top of this, he also admitted to owning a gun, that the blue room was where Jessica and Austin lived, and that he and the couple didn't get along. His explanation for the blood found in the blue room was that Jessica had, quote, cut herself. But as for the bullet holes and rounds that were recovered, well, he supposedly could not explain those. The report closes, noting that it was obvious that the room had just been painted and cleaned fairly recently, just another point of suspicion in a pile of mounting evidence. It's important to note that Michael Dudley has technically not been convicted yet, but things definitely don't look good at this point, and despite all the evidence I just outlined, he still decided to plead not guilty. Jessica's aunt has come forward to speak publicly about the loss of her niece, and according to her, she just wants people to recognize that inside those bags and beyond the viral videos were real people. She describes Jessica as having been beautiful and a ray of sunshine, who was also a mother of four. Austin is described by his family as having faith, a big heart, and having loved the outdoors, Jessica, and his entire family. On October 22nd of 2018, this disturbing video was uploaded to Chinese social media and quickly went viral. Now, that may have been a bit confusing, so allow me to clarify. You probably noticed that the video, obviously shot at night, shows the exterior of some kind of building. According to the user who uploaded it, what you're looking at is Lin Yi Mental Hospital, located in eastern China. It goes without saying that whatever's happening inside is putting someone under an extreme amount of distress, and even worse, that person sounds a lot like a child. His screams alone would be enough for this video to grab the attention of the masses, but what really made this clip blow up has to do with the aforementioned hospital. The thing is, this isn't just any mental hospital. The uploader claimed that the screams seemed to specifically be coming from somewhere he called Room 13, a place they themselves claimed to be a past victim of. All of this was reported in an article by the South China Morning Post a couple days later, and in it, Linny Mental Hospital denies the existence of Room 13, and also insists that all of its procedures are perfectly safe. If this is to be believed, then what was the deal with that video, and why did so many people latch onto it? One might assume it was due to quick outrage or a belief in conspiracy theories, but that's actually not what's going on here. Screams aren't exactly unheard of when it comes to mental health facilities, but Chinese onlookers had a very real and valid reason to be concerned nonetheless. The tale of Room 13 begins in 2006 with a doctor by the name of Yang Yongjin, a practicing clinical psychiatrist at Linyi Mental Hospital. 
By this point in time, the concept of gaming and or internet addiction became a concern for unfamiliar parents pretty much all across the globe. But in China, the government went one step further, controversially labeling, quote, internet addiction disorder, a mental illness. As such, panicked parents began sending their children to boot camp style treatment centers that are now infamous for their harsh conditions and corporal punishment. Dr. Yan Yongjin is known to many as being one of the worst offenders due to his attempts to treat so-called internet addiction with electroconvulsive therapy, popularly known as electroshock therapy. Room 13 was actually the name given to Dr. Yang's treatment room. Now, before we move forward, I do want to point out that many in the modern age do find electroconvulsive therapy to be beneficial. While still a last resort, it's not exactly what most people picture. According to Scientific American, the patient is consenting and placed under both anesthesia and muscle relaxers to both eliminate pain and reduce risk of injury. Depictions of electroconvulsive therapy used as a means of punishment are often based on conditions synonymous with mental health in decades past, such as the 1950s, for example. Now, Room 13, as you might have guessed, was definitely stuck in the past and featured a long list of ethical issues. First off, the bootcamp style environment and arbitrary admission requirements were already distressing enough. But on top of that, the children and minors placed under Dr. Yang's care weren't consenting at all and often terrorized into conformity. As for the actual treatment itself, it was as inhumane as you could imagine. Again, in modern practice, the patient is placed under anesthesia, but Dr. Yang was known to skip that entirely, leaving his young patients to feel every second of his so-called treatment. As it turns out, this type of treatment, even when done properly and humanely, is basically never used on younger patients and again is seen as a complete last resort, not something that you administer at the drop of a hat. According to Dr. Yang, however, his treatment for internet addiction had almost a 100% success rate, and at first he was hailed by the Chinese media as a hero. In 2009, China Central Television, a state-run network, released a short documentary about his practice in which Dr. Yang was praised, and the internet, particularly online gaming, was demonized. This broadcast turned heads and naturally got people talking, but not for the reasons China Central Television had hoped. Instead of agreeing with Dr. Yang's methods, many former patients, victims really, began to speak up, igniting widespread outrage across the Chinese internet. In a strange turn of events, the Chinese government responded to the criticism not by silencing people, but with an outright ban on electroconvulsive therapy as a means to treat internet addiction. And from that point forward, Room 13 and the entire program were technically disbanded, or so people thought. Even following the 2009 ban, Dr. Yang did not stop. Instead, he insisted that he could continue to treat young patients with a low-frequency electronic treatment that he swore was different from what he was doing in the past. Despite this, though, critics of Dr. Yang knew what was actually happening, and in their minds, nothing had changed at all. The video mentioned at the beginning of this segment to them was the closest thing to proof they could get, but even without it, victims who leave Dr. Yang Yongjin's grasp know exactly what's happening. As things stand now, the old Room 13 may not exist anymore, but even so, a new one has definitely taken its place, and it seems like nothing is going to stop it. On December 10th of 1979, 33-year-old John Mercure passed away from what appeared to be an overdose. His mother, Marion Gonzalez, enlisted the help of Sacramento's Memorial Lawn Mortuary to help lay John to rest. Back in August of that year, Memorial Lawn Mortuary took on a new apprentice embalmer, a 21-year-old woman by the name of Karen Greenlee. The subject of this segment and the person who would go on to traumatize John's entire family for her own satisfaction. By December 17th, John was to be laid to rest. A private burial was scheduled for approximately 10 a.m., but if things did go as planned, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. 10 a.m. came and left, but by that point, 
nothing about the situation was normal. John, or rather his body, was missing, which in itself was already strange enough, but to top this all off, so was his casket, the company hearse, and one Karen Greenlee. For the next 24 hours, authorities searched for Greenlee and, by extension, the missing corpse and vehicle. Once they were all found, however, things only got more unusual. The hearse was spotted over an hour and a half away from Sacramento in a heavily wooded area. Inside was an overdose but still alive Karen Greenlee, the corpse of John Mercure, and a letter. One that explained the bizarre string of events that had just taken place. According to the letter, Karen was actually a necrophiliac. She'd taken an interest in John despite him not being alive, but it doesn't end there. In the four and a half page letter, the woman also admitted to using her position at the mortuary to have sex with the corpses of up to 40 men a practice she would later expand upon five years later in an interview with Jim Morton for his book Apocalypse Culture. As noted in the book, Karen's initial confession letter was full of regret. She called her necrophilia an addiction and pondered over what exactly drove her to do such things. By the time of the interview, however, Karen was a changed woman, no longer ashamed, and what she said would go on to become infamous. In excruciating detail, Karen explains her attraction to corpses, noting that everything from the cold to the smell had an erotic effect on her. Blood purging from a corpse wasn't a problem to her either. In fact, she actually enjoyed it. As the interview goes on, Karen explains that after the incident in Sacramento, she'd gotten a job at a new funeral home, one that she had the keys to and would often, quote, slip back into after hours and spend all night at. When she didn't have access to a corpse via a job, Karen found other ways to satisfy her urges, including routinely breaking into another nearby mortuary until a close call in which she was almost caught. Now, as if things couldn't get any weirder, Karen also admits to attending the funerals of the people whose bodies she'd used for sexual gratification. Right now, you're probably picturing her either standing at a distance or maybe even being in attendance as a staff member. But in actuality, Karen, for whatever reason, would actually interact with the deceased family, even going as far as to pretend to be an old friend or sometimes even a girlfriend. Karen's self-described addiction extends beyond just physical acts with corpses. To many, she would at times almost come off more like a needy partner, something made even more evident by the fact that sometime after the incident, John McCure's body was to be exhumed and moved to another state, and somehow Karen managed to catch wind of this and actually watched as John's body was dug up and hauled away. Towards the end of the interview, Karen is asked about the prevalence of necrophilia within the funeral home industry, and while while it's important to note that she's only a singular source, she claims that, quote, Necrophilia is more prevalent than most people imagine. Funeral homes just don't report it. Again, this is just one person's claim, and there isn't much data available on the topic anyway, so let's shift our attention back to Karen. What exactly happened after police found her, and were there legal ramifications? In short, yes, but not in the way that you'd think. Karen ended up pleading guilty to both interfering with a funeral and unauthorized use of the company hearse, but she was never actually charged for having sexual contact with John McCure's corpse. At the time, California had no laws specifically barring acts of necrophilia, and this might come as a shock, but such laws weren't even actually put into place in the state until 2004. As a result of this, Karen was only made to pay a fine of $255, along with an 11-day jail sentence, which John's mother naturally found unacceptable. She later took both Karen Greenlee and Memorial Lawn Mortuary to court, eventually settling for $117,000 in damages. These days, Karen is supposedly still alive, but she's largely gone off the map and reportedly regrets giving the Apocalypse Culture interview. And what happened after that is unclear, but one can only hope that she never did strike again, even if it is unfortunately wishful thinking.
If you've spent any time online at all, then you're probably familiar with the term yandere, most likely due to the prevalence of anime or because of the massive disaster that was Yandere Simulator. But in case you've only heard the term and don't actually know what it means, in short, it's pretty common within the anime fandom used to describe an oftentimes female character who, upon finding a love interest, slowly turns into a homicidal maniac due to their obsession. If you've ever seen the train wreck that is School Days, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and you'll know where the segment is going. In general, such characters are nothing but harmless fiction, but what happens when the lines between that and reality begin to blur? This was seemingly the case in May of last year in Tokyo's Shinjuku Ward. Police were called over to an apartment building where a young male had supposedly been attacked, and once they arrived, they happened upon a scene that was both bizarre and chilling. The apartment's lobby area was practically covered in blood, and its source was readily in sight. The injured man was found on his back and almost completely nude aside from his underwear, his stomach area sliced open. Next to him sat a young woman covered in blood. In crime scene photos, she was pictured calmly smoking a cigarette and even chatting on her phone at the same time. If based on her composure you assumed that she was the attacker, then you'd absolutely be correct. But what could drive someone to do such a thing? The woman, now booked for attempted murder, was cooperative and didn't hold back explaining why she had done what she did. Her name was Yuka Takaoka, a 21-year-old bar hostess, and per her statements, the male victim was her very own live-in boyfriend. According to TokyoReporter.com, a local anonymous source claimed that the couple had only lived together for about three days before Yuka supposedly found images of her boyfriend posing with other women, which subsequently led to her attacking while the man slept. Now, for most people, possible infidelity would obviously be very upsetting, but it usually wouldn't result in attempted murder. But further statements provided by Yuka herself would paint a portrait of a very disturbed young woman. Upon arrest, police found a note on her phone, a confession of sorts. Roughly translated, this is what it says. I wanted to be a tragic heroine. How could I make sure he only saw me? The answer was to kill him. If I kill you, it's forever. Nothing will hurt anymore. I don't want anything other than you." The sentiment is pretty much reiterated in statements Yuka herself gave directly to police. She explains that she couldn't help herself due to how much she loved her boyfriend and that she wanted to die after he did. In most cases, this would be a pretty open-shut case, and legally, of course, it was. She was caught at the scene and even confessed. Her victim luckily survived and eventually recovered, but this isn't the end of the story. When talking about Yuka Takaoka, half of the story is usually about her and what she did, and the other half is her notoriety, which quickly became too prominent to ignore. By the day after the attacks, news reports of Yuka's attempt at murdering her boyfriend had already made its way into the news cycle, and by extension, the internet. All over the world, violent killers are usually expected to be scary-looking men, so whenever that expectation isn't realized, people tend to react in a number of ways. I've talked about true crime fandoms on this channel before, and in that case, the most infamous example would probably be Columbiners, aka people who idolize or sometimes even develop emotional attacks attachments to the Columbine shooters. Another few examples would be the likes of Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, who all had dedicated followings and suitors even during their time in prison. This case was no different as people online took an immediate interest in Yuka, her apparent beauty, and the melodramatic reasoning behind her violence, something many people found eerily similar to the Yandere characters mentioned at the beginning of this segment. Now, it should be noted that when it comes to the internet, it's impossible to tell exactly what people's motivations are or how much of it is sarcasm. In many ways, Yuka Takaoka, or the real-life Yandere as people were calling her, became more of a meme than actually being idolized since the concept of yandere in general is heavily memed even to this day. Nonetheless, there were people out there dedicated to working in her interests, whether genuine or not. A lot of the sentiment was that she was too pretty to be in prison, or that she just did what she did out of love. Fan art was made, and at one point even a successful GoFundMe was created to bail her out, although it was reported and subsequently removed. This, as you can expect, wasn't the only GoFundMe to pop up, but again, it's hard to say for sure how many of these people were joking or scamming versus actually trying to help Yuka. 
Either way, for better or for worse, this girl was now internationally known and beloved by many, and the fact that this case was popularly tied to yandere and by extension anime slash manga actually has wider implications than one might assume at first. In the West, the term otaku is generally understood to simply mean a fan of anime or manga, while in Japan it's more of a general term akin to nerd. But the word can hold negative connotations. Instead of seeing a fan of popular media as just being that, the quote otaku stereotype conjures up images of someone completely consumed by their media of choice to the point of obsession or even antisocial behavior. To a lot of people, otaku don't fit in with the rest of functioning society, and while not everyone sees it this way, otaku are sometimes blamed for violent crime, which further perpetuates the stigma that somehow being a fan of a certain type of media makes you an unhinged sociopath. A western parallel to this is a notion that somehow lives on to this day, that violent video games make people violent despite there being absolutely no proof of this. We must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. It is too easy today for troubled youth to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. In the same way, Yuka Takaoka's actions became another talking point for those looking to validate their misconceptions, and at this point there probably isn't much use in trying to change their minds. In late 2019, several months after the attempted murder, Yuka Takaoka would be seen in court crying upon receiving her conviction. She was set to spend three and a half years in prison, and while most who have heard of this case don't know of its outcome, those who do are shocked at how light the sentence turned out to be. For only Almost killing someone, this girl is basically going to serve no time at all. And what's most troubling here is that there are some people out there who are patiently waiting for her release. These were five stories from our very own disturbing world, real life tales that remind us that true horror lurks just around the corner, even in everyday life. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing as there will definitely be more. But in the meantime, check out other episodes in the series, and if you have a story that you'd like to see make an appearance on the show, feel free to drop me a line at rainbotinbox at gmail.com. This video would not be possible without the help of my supporters on Patreon, but especially the following people. AJ Runaway, Astro, Base of Shadow, Bloody the Elf, Borealis Knight, Catherine L, Connor H, Corky Barks, Daniel G, David G, Isaac, Eric M, Esper Nix, Fern, Gel Farrell, Chris M, Lance, Mortal Nat, Psycho, Roxanne S, Sean the CHB, Tyler T, Ulysses, Aaron V, Amelia J, Andrew L, Benjamin M, Eric H, Francisco B, It's Mitt, YOLO for Jesus. Jake M, James M, Joel H, Keith Z, Luck B, Matt J, Melody, Nick B, S Estrada, Scorian S, Sophie A, Sydney G, T Gorman, Tristan J, Zarai, and AJM. Thank you all so much for your support, and to everyone else, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.